loves you, he kisses you, and when he kisses you, he leaves the quality of eternity. Amen. Turn, if you would, to the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation, chapter 2. Uh, we'll be reading verses 1 through 7. Book of Revelation is rather easy to find. Just go all the way to the right. Last book in the Bible, the revelation of Christ through John the seer, John the apostle, chapter 2. I want to lift up verses 1 through 7 in the New International Version of the Greek text. If you found it, say amen. amen. If you were to turn there, you'll find these words. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You've persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love remember the height from which you've fallen repent and do the things you did at first if you do not repent i will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place but you have this in your favor you hate the practices of nicolation which i also hate he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches to him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Verse 4, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Amen. You may be seated with the help of the Holy Spirit in your prayers. I want to preach from the subject, the church where the thrill is gone. The church where the thrill is gone amen those in the vestibule ask them to come in quickly quietly and reverently so i try to talk to you about the church where the thrill is gone amen worshipers are still coming in trying to find them seats and uh, i want them to get seated and situated so that they can hear what the spirit has to say to the church where the thrill is gone. Amen. Amen. Thank God for air conditioning. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> She's glad you're going to heaven, aren't you? <laughs> Amen. The church where the thrill is gone. Amen. Throughout the centuries, the book of Revelation has been considered a book very difficult to understand. So difficult is this book to understand that one scholar has suggested that there are as many riddles as there are words in Revelation. And it caused that great German theologian Martin Luther to audaciously recommend in times past that Revelation, the book, be stricken from the Christian canon. But there's a reason why the book of Revelation is a difficult book to understand. It is difficult to understand because it is a book that was deliberately written in cryptic or coded language. It was written that way because it was written during the time when the church was going through great persecution. John was on the Isle of Patmos and received this apocalyptic revelatory word to a people who were under pressure and he wanted to communicate 
an encouraging word to the persecuted without the persecutor getting the message. And this very idea of communicating in cryptic language in an environment or atmosphere of persecution is not something that should be wasted on those of us whose skin has been kissed by nature's son. We ought to know something. If you know anything about your history, that this is not a new thing. For our African foreparents, when they were laboring in slavery under the hot blistering rays of the sun, were in the habit of communicating with one another through cryptic or coded language. Usually, often, it was in the form of song. For example, while in the fields, they would sing, swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. And when the slave master heard that song, he thought he was just listening to happy slaves singing a song about going to heaven and enjoying the time in the sweet by and by. But in fact, they were communicating a double message. They were not simply talking about going to heaven in the sweet by and by, but when they said, swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home, they were alerting the slaves to the fact that the Underground Railroad was going to swing down to the south and take them up not to the sweet by and by, but to the sweet here and now in the freedom of the north. Or they would sing, wait in the water, wait in the water, children, wait in the water, God's going to trouble the water. And they thought they were singing some innocent, innocuous song about baptism, when in fact, they were signaling to the slave that when you get a chance to escape, make sure you wade in the water, because the bloodhounds won't be able to pick up your sin. And so it is not uh, unusual that people in oppression would uh, communicate in cryptic or coded language for the purposes of communicating to the oppressed in the presence of the oppressor. And that is what is happening in the book of Revelation. Why it is so difficult to decode because it is in coded language. But the language that it uses was language or codes that the people who were receiving would have understood and the intent was to encourage those who were under great pressure and persecution. And I want to uh, underline and underscore and highlight and put in bold letters the fact that they were encouraging the saints in the midst of persecution. And that's important because if you read the book of Revelation and you get scared, then you must be misreading the book of Revelation because the book of Revelation wasn't to scare the saints, it was to encourage the saints, to let them know that even though you're going through trouble, trouble don't last always. And even if you have to die for holding on to the faith, it says in Revelation, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yea, says the Spirit, for they shall rest from their labors and their works do follow them. And so it was a word that was intended to encourage the saints, written to the church of Jesus Christ. And even though it, was a, it is a difficult book to decode and understand even today, there is one section in the book of Revelation that is an unquestionably clear and eternally relevant, re relevant section of the book of Revelation known as the letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. That is where our text comes from. It comes from that section of scripture where the revelator John is receiving a message from the Spirit of Christ who is relaying a message to his church. And that's important, my brothers and sisters, because the church is precious to Christ. In fact, the New Testament tells us that we are the bride, which makes Jesus the bridegroom. And J.C. Perkins has so eloquently said that when Jesus rose from the grave and ascended or leapt from the craggy cloud shrouded cleft of Olivet, caught a cloud and worked his wondrous way back to heaven, he says that on the way up he slipped an engagement ring on the church's finger and said, occupy until I return. In other words, Jesus is coming back for his church, but understand that he has high standards. 
he's not just coming back for any church but he's coming back for a church without spot or without wrinkle and if in fact we're going to be a church that knows that we are spotless and wrinkle free then it would do us well to pay attention to what Jesus has to say to his churches because his analysis critique and evaluation of the seven churches is a way whereby we can evaluate ourselves to see if we are a bride that is holding up the standards of the groom the text tells us that he begins in the book to talk to his church before he talks to the world and that's because judgment first starts at the house of God the first church he deals with in this letter to the seven churches of Asia Minor is the church in Ephesus. And Ephesus was a great town. It was a seaport town. It was a place where a mixed population of people came, all types of people. It was a rich and prosperous place because it was a seaport town. It was a place that boasted uh, the Temple of Diane, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was a place that was considered a free city in the Roman Empire because of its contribution to the Roman Empire it was given the privilege of uh, uh, of taking care of its own citizens under its own rules even though it was in a Roman Empire Ephesus was a place that had a special place in the heart of the Apostle Paul if you can recall Paul found some Christians there and helped take them into a deeper life and when he finished his three uh, missionary journeys and on the fourth one was on his way to Rome as a prisoner remember he stopped at a place near Ephesus and was given the opportunity to call for the elders and they came and visited together and to show how deep the love was for them when it was time for them to depart the Bible says they wept and fell on each other's necks and cried for one another because they thought that they would never see each other again Ephesus was a place of wickedness as well as prosperity all types of things happened in Ephesus and Ephesus in the minds of many was a place that was among a most unlikely place for a church and yet right there in Ephesus they established a strong fellowship there right there in Ephesus there was a Christian witness Bible says in our text that when Jesus speaks through John on the island of Patmos to give a word during a time of persecution to this church at Ephesus it begins with a description of Christ and you'll notice if you read all of the seven addresses to the seven churches of Asia Minor each of them have a unique way of describing Jesus each one seems tailor-made to the church that he's talking to and when he talks to Ephesus and begins his evaluation and assessment of their faithfulness and loyalty and health it begins with a description of Jesus that we ought to take note of. Notice it says from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden candlesticks. Notice how it describes Jesus. The one, listen, who holds the seven stars in his right hand. The seven stars symbolize the leaders of the church and the churches themselves. And notice that he says he holds them in his right hand most people are right handed that's your good hand your strong hand your best hand so when it says he holds the seven stars in his right hand it means he holds it in the hand of power and authority and watch he says those seven churches seven stars seven pastors he holds in the hollow in the palm of his hand of power and authority when it says he holds the churches in his hand what it means at first is that he holds he possesses them which means that he possesses owns or the church is his church it isn't the church that belongs to anyone else Jesus is in sole possession of his church and that's important for us to remember sometimes because the church doesn't belong to pastors it doesn't belong to deacons it doesn't belong to trustees it doesn't belong to the family that gives the most money or the members who have the longest tenure that this church belongs to Christ in fact as soon as the church becomes yours it stops being a church it starts to become a club 
the church can't belong to us because we are the church every time you say this is my church what you mean is that that's the church you belong to and not the church you possess because you don't qualify to possess the church you didn't come for it live for it die for it get up for it make intercession for it and you ain't coming back for it so it ain't your church you are a member of the church that is held in the right hand of Jesus he holds the seven stars he possesses it and that makes me want to shout that he holds well listen not only does he possess the church but the fact that he holds it in his hand means that he's in control of his church and that's important my brothers is to remember that he controls his church one of the things that liberated me as a pastor early in my ministry is when I realized that the future of the church did not belong to me I wish I had some help in here. It did not depend upon me. I was taking too much responsibility for the future of the church. I figured when it failed, it was my fault. If it's going to succeed, it had to be because of me. But I realized this ain't my church. And one of the things that helped me get some sleep at night early in my ministry is when I made a decision to give it back to God. Because he can do more with his own church than I can. Somebody say control. He's in control of his church and that's important. Again, to remember because it seems like it is the inclination and proclivity of human creatures that as soon as we break our mother's womb and make our debut on the stage of human history, that we don't want to be controlled by anybody, even Jesus. We don't mind him being our savior. We just don't want him to be Lord because Lord means leader and leader means he gets to call the shots. And there's certain things in our lives that even now some saints are off limits to the savior. Come on preach it here look 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 there's certain things in your life that you let the lord make decisions about but there's certain things in your life that you say i got this i'm going to decide this i'll make the decisions about this but he will be lord of all but he or he will not be lord at all somebody say control you're in a better place when you give him control of your life the way to relate to the one who has the church in his hand is you got to learn how to surrender to his influence and his control the fact that he holds it not only means that he's in control of the church but it means that he cares for the church that he protects the church y'all don't even know where to shout because he's talking to people who are under persecution and he's saying that even though you may be in a life-threatening situation, remember that I hold you. God, y'all don't know where to shout. He said, I look at your name and say, he's got you. That's what he's saying. It doesn't matter what you're going through, how hard or hellish it is. It doesn't get the last word because I got you. <laughs> you may have to suffer and suffering may not be make sense but listen the central nervous system is not the final arbiter of truth god gets the last word do you know why he gets the last word because he's alpha and omega he's the first and the last he's beginning and the end so when the enemy tries to tell you that he gets the last word you call him the liar that he is because the lord He's got you. I can't understand how y'all could be so calm. One of the things that helps me keep pastoring a church is because I know he's got me. Because see, whenever you're in leadership, whether in the church or in the community or both, it may come with recognition, but the fact that you are lifted also makes you an easier target. And leaders got enemies. Enemies out the church. The enemy that's enemy and then there's even enemies in the church I wish I had some help in here anybody been hurt by enemies in the church because everybody that smells like a sheep ain't a sheep some are sheep wolves in sheep clothing but the reason why I ain't never scared is because he said in his word that he's holding me and the reason why I've made it so far is because he's got me. And the reason why you've made it so far is because he got you. Look at your neighbor and say, he got you. He says, I, the one who holds 
seven stars in his right hand. It gets even better because not only does he hold the seven stars in his right hand, but the text says, and he walks among the seven golden candlesticks. When he says he walks among the seven golden candlesticks, that's a reference to the fact that the priests during the time of Israel had the task of walking in the holy place and tending the seven branched golden lampstand. It was his job to make sure that it kept on burning. And in order to do that, he would have to go in there periodically and cut off dead parts of the wick, light it afresh with light, pour in some more oil, move any debris that threatened the light. That's what the priest would do. And since Jesus is the one who walks among the seven golden candlesticks, you do understand that because he has nail prints in his hand and his feet and in his side, that that qualifies him to be our high priest. And just like the high priest walked among the seven golden candlesticks to tend to the light there, it is good to know that Jesus walks among his churches and he does what the priest did in the temple. He comes to the church and he cuts off any dead places in the church he lights light where there needs to be light he adds oil or more holy ghost and he removes any foreign debris that might threaten our capacity to be worthy to meet him in the midair when he returns he moves he monitors he ministers <laughs> among his churches y'all again y'all don't know where to shout because see if he's moving if the master is moving miracles follow in his way and when he comes harlots become pure and drunkards become sober and liars start telling the truth when he stopped in fact he's moving right now anybody feel him moving can i tell you why that shouts me he says he moves among the seven golden candlesticks the reason why that shouts me is because that means that whenever the people of god get together he starts to move and no other organization can say that alphas can't say it kappas can't say it omegas can't say it deltas can't say it y'all don't hear me aka's masons the government can't say it but i heard jesus say where two or three are gathered together in my name I start moving. He moves <laughs> among the seven golden candlesticks. He he starts moving. Whenever he starts moving, something starts happening. And whenever he's on the premises, there's power to do the impossible. Somebody say, "Move, Lord." And he starts to move. He starts to move. Note that the text says he moves among the seven golden candlesticks and anybody who knows about biblical numerology knows that seven is the number for completion or perfection so when he says he moves among the seven golden candlesticks it means that those candlesticks are all churches everywhere which means that is not a particular denominational affiliation but any community of faith that is full of the twice born whether it's AME, UCC, Presbyterian, Catholic come on Church of God, Christ, AOH, Foot Washing Baptist, Free Will Baptist it don't matter it don't matter because when you get to heaven ain't gonna be a Methodist or Baptist or Episcopalian section he's moving in all of his church somebody say he moves yeah I like it he moves so he holds and he moves so that's the one who's about to address his church he's the one who protects you and provides for you and controls you and possesses you he's the one that moves and monsters and ministers among you he's the one that brings the miracles necessary in order for you to become everything the Lord wants you to become it is this Christ who is about to address the church at Ephesus and when he addresses it he begins by saying and i know stop right there <laughs> he says that more than once i know he says it again i know when he's looking at the church he's saying when i look at you there's nothing that escapes my eyes i see everything and so i know everything there's two sides to that coin can i talk about it the first side is that you can pretend you can front you can fake all you want live like hell and come here and praise heaven all you want put a smile on your face put something to go to me and close and pretend if you please 
and the other person sitting next to you may not even know but he knows somebody say he knows you can talk in tongues, fall out in the ground, quote scripture, but he knows. Somebody say he knows. You can't fool God. His eye is on the sparrow. Somebody say he knows. He says, I know, I know. That's one side. Can I flip the coin? Let me flip the coin. On the other side of the coin is this. You might be faithful. You might be serving doing God's will and nobody notices or if they do they don't care but it don't matter because even if they don't know <laughs> somebody ought to do a holy dance right now because people have a tendency to take you for granted they don't appreciate you but he knows and that ought to matter to you because even if folk knew they couldn't reward you like he can Somebody say he knows. <laughs> so you can roll your eyes at me if you want. You can ignore me if you want. You can treat me like I'm nobody if you want. But he knows. I mean, I drive the car you drive, have the job you drive, have the clothes you got, and the education you got. But if I'm faithful over a few things, he will make me rule over many because he knows somebody just take 10 seconds and give him praise because he knows yes he does uh, I gotta cut across the field but I can stay there for about a week I can, I can preach a series on he knows he knows how much I can bear. He knows where I am. He knows what I'm going through. He knows what it takes to get me through there. He knows what I need before I ask. He knows. Yes, he does. I said, he said, he said, I know. Watch. He, he says, he says, I know I've been doing some evaluation and some observation. He said, I, I've taken your temperature, looked in your mouth and said, oh, done some x-rays. He said, uh, and some things I see. He says, I, first of all, I know you. We are changed people, changing the world. We are changed people, changing the world. We are changed people, changing the world. But wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not how the story ends.